Good evening and uh, good morning, depending on where you are around the world. My name is Federico Ri, and I'm the founder of uh, Creative Entrepreneur, and I'm also the co-host of Inspire Talk Radio, uh, which is aired all around the world on Google uh, Hangout or Google Plus. And also joining me tonight, I have uh, my fabulous co-host Laura Huxley. How are you going, Laura? I'm great, thanks, Federico. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure once again. Um, now I know it's it's pretty cold in Melbourne, um, and, and we've had a pretty tough winter. But what's it like in Sydney today? It's actually been really lovely today in Sydney. It's been quite sunny, no no rain, so yeah, it's lovely. Awesome, awesome. Now. We have a very special guest tonight, uh, which I'll introduce formally in just a few moments, uh, and, and I'll just give you a bit of a sneak peek. Her name is Lisa Messenger, for those of you who don't know that. Um, but um, Laura, if you wanted to give the audience a bit of a quick spill on what Inspire Talk is all about, uh, so that you know, they know what to expect from tonight's show. Yeah, sure. What well, Inspire Talk Radio is uh, a radio show that we host on Google Hangouts, and we interview game changers, leaders in their field, visionaries, anybody who is leading the way and, and sharing insights and, and stories and experiences around um, entrepreneurship, around leadership, anything to do with um, great things happening. So we're so excited to have Lisa Messenger on the show with us because she is certainly leading the way. Um, and yeah, we have exciting guests coming up in the future as well. So it's all very, very exciting. Absolutely, and um, the show is relatively quite new. It's been uh, airing probably for less than a year, and um, over the time we've, we've introduced some amazing people. Uh, but let's stop right here, right now, and let's formally introduce uh, Lisa Messenger. How are you going, Lisa? I'm great. Good to be here with you guys. After my slight technical ineptitude, we have arrived. <laughs> we have certainly arrived. And, uh, look, I, I wanted to give you a big thank you for your time tonight. Uh, I know it's evening, and you've probably got a million other things to do. Um, I also wanted to say I'm privileged, uh, we are privileged to have you on the show. Um, you have obviously a lot of accolades, a lot of credential, a lot of um, experience and background in entrepreneurship. Um, perhaps the worst serial entrepreneur and game changer, game changer is probably just the beginning of how to best describe you. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'd like to, you know, just for the viewers to, to sort of know who, who you are, Lisa, I'll, um, I'll introduce you how you, you've formally presented yourself um, across your, your media channels. So I'll just read that out for everyone else's sake. Um, Lisa Messenger is the CEO of the Messenger Group, a media and publishing company, as well as founder and editor-in-chief of the Collective Hub, an entrepreneurial lifestyle magazine distributed in over 30 countries with a mandate to disrupt, challenge, and inspire. Uh, in addition, Lisa has worked globally in events, sponsorship, marketing, PR, and publishing. Lisa has authored and co-authored over a dozen books and has become an authority in the startup scene. And she lives in beautiful, sunny Sydney. So um, that's an awesome write-up, uh, Lisa. And uh, once again, it's, it's an honor to have you. So I guess um, to, to kick start tonight's discussion around your journey, around your story as an entrepreneur, and also what you got up to, what you get up to every day in the publishing arena, perhaps I'll hand it over to Laura, who will, who will you know, fire away the very first question. So Laura, on to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Beth. Um, Lisa, I would love to know about taking risks because you talk a lot, um, especially in daring and disruptive, about taking risks and disrupting and, and having passion and purpose as an entrepreneur. How important is that in regards to kind of paving the way for yourself or either you know making ripples in the industry? How important is it to be disruptive and daring? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, it, it, thank you. It's a great first question. I guess for me, you know, being daring and disruptive, which is the name of the first of this series of books that have actually sold. <laughs> um, right. You know, it really depends what that means for everyone as an individual. You know, my journey is my journey, and it's different mm. for everyone. Um, for me, you know, it's kind of like a fifteen-year overnight success, I guess. I mean, I started my first business on um, 22nd of October 2001. So for 11 years, I was kind of over-servicing and undercharging and being everything to everyone and having no real purpose. I mean, I had a great business and I was comfortable, but I don't really think comfortable is a great place to be. And, um, and so for me, it was kind of like I got to a point of, do I move to Byron Bay and become a hippie because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> um, or do I go big? And um, 
and I decided to go big. So for me, it has been very a very conscious and purposeful decision to you know to go hard and to really push myself. And mm -hmm. um, you know, we just came out pretty hard disrupting an age-old industry, which is media. And um, and recently, in the last two weeks, we've um, actually entered the education industry as well. So looking to disrupt a second industry, which is very exciting. Um, yeah, I, 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 even... <laughs> I was going to say, I saw some information posted on that, and I'd love to hear a little bit more and share it with our viewers as well um, about moving into the education um, sector. We'd love to hear about that. Yeah, perfect. So do you want, we can get to that now or I can do that kind of sequentially and talk to you about exactly how that's come about, whichever way yeah, you want to do it. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit later on. We'll talk about it. We'll, we'll, give it, we'll give it a bit more of time so you can actually tell us, you know, a bit more about how that happened and, and what the big vision is. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, the other question I'd really love to ask you is, because I am in the public speaking arena, and um, I watched one of your, your videos today where you were talking about how um, it has been something that you've overcome and, and you used to hate public speaking. I'd love to hear from you um, what's been the benefit of that for you in regards to overcoming that, the fear or um, you know, mastering that skill. What has that meant for, for you in regards to, to leading the way? <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I do probably three or four uh, um, public speaking gigs a week now on average and all over the world. So I feel in a very grateful and fortunate position to be A, asked to be to do that and B, able to do that now <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> it, was not, it was certainly not that way. I mean, I would have rather died or done pretty much anything else on the planet than public speak and so much so when I wrote my first book which was called Happiness Is because I was so unhappy <laughs> um, and that's a whole other story about how extraordinary things come from really um, you know are often catalysts uh, from really mm. difficult times of adversity um, but anyway I wrote that book in um, October 2004 funnily enough Ten years exactly before I launched Daring and Disruptive, and um, and I did a national tour at the time with Business Chicks before mm -hmm. Ems owned it. And um, well, when I say national tour, I did Brisbane, and then I was so bad at speaking that I actually didn't even get invited back to do <laughs> to do Sydney and Melbourne. And they had someone else talk about my book in my place. I was hideous, like I was actually beyond hideous. And it took me about another three years or so at least before I was brave enough to go anywhere near a stage or an audience and um, and and then finally I did but you know I mean the reason is this it's pretty much like everything I've learned to do and everything mm -hmm. that I have overcome my fears around and it is this that I have learned to do it my way and I have sort of accepted that my way is okay and so it's funny because um, years and years ago before I started my own business I worked in conference and event management so I used to um, engage speakers all the time and you know I work with so many of them I publish so many of their books many of them are my friends and most people as you all know will learn something by rote and they will regurgitate it and they will be brilliant at it and I am completely strange and counterintuitive given my fear in that for an hour keynote I never have a single note at all. I meditate for at least 15 minutes before to hardcore deep house. <laughs> That's for my meditation. <laughs> awesome. And I then love I that. go uh, yeah, and then I go on stage and I just let everything out of my head and whatever comes comes and I have traversed every single industry. I was on stage in New Zealand recently speaking to 1200 real estate agents. Um, last week I was doing um, keynoting for the L'Oreal conference in Melbourne. Like you name it, I have done it now. I was on the stage with Richard Branson doing the Virgin Collab recently um, across five Virgin companies and every single time I don't plan a thing. So I am very, very strange and that is probably not how you teach or how anyone remotely sensible should do it. <laughs> but the thing is that the there is no right way 
to do things, you know. Mm. It's all about learning what works for you and weirdly enough, that works for me. Now that would scare the crap out of most people, like getting up there without any plans but somehow I know my stuff and that way I stay present and connected with the audience. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that because one, I mean, I, I love that you do it your own way because one of the, the biggest things that I, that I say a lot is that it's about trusting yourself and trusting in your experience and in your wisdom and that that's enough. And so there doesn't need to be a million slides and, you know, all of these notes. I think that that's a great way to approach it. And if, you know, if people can do that, it's fantastic. And you obviously do it really well. So thanks for sharing that with us. I would say um, that probably works for about 1% of people, though, so don't try this at home. <laughs> it works for me because <laughs> it works for me because I am living this life every single day, so it just it comes naturally to me to talk about it. You know, I can talk mm -hmm. about my journey, but then I can also talk about where I am and the grit and exactly where I am at the time, so it kind of... It works. But, yeah, just work out what works for you. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Lisa. I'll hand you over to Beth. Thank Perfect. you, Laura. Now, I know that your book is titled Daring and Disruptive, and that's um, your latest book, um, if I'm correct. Um, and I've also got to confess that I finished reading it at 1 o'clock today, um, obviously as a prelude to our discussion tonight. I really wanted to understand your psychology and your, your journey as such. And one thing that stands out, obviously, and, and hence the title of your, your book, is the word disruptive. Uh, what does that actual word mean to you, and, and how is it relevant or perhaps critical uh, for an entrepreneur? Lisa. So I just have to jump in there, and I don't want to correct you, but I'm going to have to, because I wrote Daring and Disruptive in October 2004, but I've actually written three more books since then. So I wrote four books and then three playbooks in 14 well, months. Congratulations. <laughs> But thank you. But that's um. But daring and disruptive, and probably money and mindfulness, which came out last October, are most relevant to this conversation. So um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> I got it. It's amazing. <laughs> Stop that. Stop that, Laura. You're trying to compete. <laughs> thank you. Um. So sorry. Back to the question. So um. So being disruptive or being daring, what were we talking about? No, disruptive. How, how is that important for entrepreneurs and what does it mean to you? Okay, so I think coming back to what Laura asked initially, I mean disruptive, okay, disruptive has meant different things for me throughout my life but this is probably an info, important conversation and it informs a little bit why I've gone into education more recently. So when I was at school, um, Disru and many people will relate to this. Disruptive was not seen as a good thing. Disruptive for me in the classroom meant that I was always asking, but why, but why, but how, but how, right? And as a result of asking that in a school room, in the classroom, I was perpetually thrown outside and sitting in the hallway and never learning anything <laughs> because <laughs> they teach in a very convergent way and, you know, you will learn this and one size fits all and you will not buck the status quo and you will fit in a box. Now what's interesting is um, those very same things that were considered disruptive in the classroom are what are celebrated for me and for many of us as entrepreneurs. And so the nature of the word disruptive has changed um, many times for me throughout my life and I now you know, celebrate massively being disruptive. So what disruptive means for me in its current iteration is that um, when I entered uh, media, so magazines. Let's talk about Collective Hub. So I launched it on the 28th of February um, 2013, so three and a half years ago. Now I had <laughs> never worked for a magazine. I had three staff under the age of 25, none of whom had ever worked for, the mag for a magazine. Um, we had no idea what we were doing, no money, no smarts, no credibility, pretty much nothing, zip, zero, zilch. And we were going into an industry which people said was either dead or dying. And at the time I didn't know, um, we're now in 37 countries with the print magazine, I didn't know that um, there were over 5,500 print magazines in Australia alone, that's one of 37 markets that we're now in. So it was disruptive even though I probably didn't realise at the time because I basically flipped everything that was flippable and I was purposefully counterintuitive the whole way through. What I will say about that is this, I think we often um, 
overcomplicate life, everything, business, life. And, you know, when you strip it back and simplify it, all I did was, in my naivety, I kind of thought, okay, if I was going to put together a magazine that wanted to empower and inspire people, where would I find people to write such articles? Where would I find people to write about? Um, then I just thought, where would I want to buy that magazine? And so whilst all the other, you know, many of the five and a half thousand print magazines were doing it the way that it had always been done, I was just doing the next logical step that was in front of me. And, you know, having no money is a beautiful thing. And even though I've been, my ass has been on fire. <laughs> literally for four years now, you know, every day wondering, are we going to go under? Um, not so much lately, which is good. Um, but it's been the best thing. And this is what I talk to corporates a lot about. It's like when you have that as an entrepreneur, you are hungry. You have this insatiable appetite and you have to do things differently or disrupt because we have no choice, you know. When you have no money, you have to think about, what is my currency? What else can I trade? And so that's what I started thinking about. So um, for our viewers and listeners, if you can just draw a parallel and ignore magazine and media landscape, because I've done this now about 18 different times across multiple industries in the last four years. So what I, what I did was I just looked at, um, okay, ignore what the traditional media landscape are doing. So magazines were essentially their business model was selling a flat ad on a page for say $8,000. Now say you have to discount that to $5,000. The print magazine in one market alone cost me when I launched 350 Australian dollars a month. 350,000. Sorry, let's have a few zeros. <laughs> um, so you divide $350,000 by, say, $5,000 by the time you've discounted. My maths is crap, but that's, say, 70 ads I would have had to sell to even break even on a traditional model. So I had to think really quickly, and this is where the disruption comes in. I started selling $200,000 packages, right? Unheard of. Nuts. You know, like I'm smoking crack or <laughs> whatever. I don't know. And the reason was I kind of was like, is, I'm never going to be able to do this if I don't do it differently. So I thought about what's my currency? Well, I'm going to have a print magazine so I can do articles, I can do editorial, I can do advertorial. I now kind of know how to speak. I can do speaking gigs. We can give away physical copies of the print magazine. So I just kept thinking about what can I exchange? What's the value exchange for money to help me get going? And that's how I started doing deals and that's how I've done deals ever since. And now we actually have three full-time people in my team who purely work on non-monetary exchanges and it becomes really exciting because if when you remove cash as the only currency, it sort of becomes, um, okay, I like your vision and your values and your belief system. How else can we trade? How else can we do business? And so I've done that over and over and over and over again. So I think that's kind of what disruption means for me. It's like do not be fearful and do not be constrained by perceived um, barriers. Because I tell you, if some little punk who knew nothing about anything to do with media can do what I've done, then you know truly anything is possible. So that's kind of, I guess that's kind of disruption to me. And we've we've done it so many times now. And we can talk about more how I've built out a number of different um, business units and revenue streams if you like, because that's kind of interesting and something I get asked about a lot. Absolutely. Look, your story is extraordinary. In fact, it's it sounds like a, a major roller coaster that a major roller coaster <laughs> you've been on for a number of years. And look, I congratulate you. And I know that in the world of business, it's always a tough year. Um, a lot of what you've said uh, does define your your personality, your your character, your attributes. And one thing I do want to explore just briefly um, it is that mindset um, of the entrepreneur. And being an entrepreneurship coach myself, I'm always intrigued to understand your perspective or your insight on what it takes to be that true grit entrepreneur. Um, one thing is self-belief and you, you've raised that point a number of times in the book. Um, how, how is self-belief um, such an important thing and how, how does that kind of translate to your people when being a leader? Mm, great question. I think, um, you know, self having an unwavering, insatiable self-belief is an absolute imperative to being an entrepreneur because, you know, as we all know, and I'm sure many people who are listening can attest to, we get knocked down and door slammed in our face, like literally hundreds of times a day. You know, when you've really got your hustle on, it's just 
it's constant. And so, um, and also, you know, people, I literally, before I got one person to say yes to, um, you know, I mean, I still own Collective Hub 100%, but uh, the money I got was sort of the sponsorship and partnerships and advertising. Um, and has remained so through the entire journey. But, um, you know, I probably had at least 80 face-to-face -face meetings before one person said yes. Everyone else was like, I don't know who you are. You have no credibility. Um, print magazine, get serious. It's dead, you know. And so I heard that over and over and over again. But there was this little thing inside me that was like, no. Nah, this this is this is important, you know. I know this is going to work. So what I would say is, for me, it's just been for a little while. It's looking for those um, small pieces of external validation. You know, some people just saying to you, uh, you know, it's just that glimmer of hope. Yes, it's going to work. Yes, it's going to work, or whatever. And then you know, riding with that. And for a while, when you start, you know, those pieces of external validation are important. But um, as we plow on, and our own internal self belief becomes uh, you know stronger and stronger then the external validation becomes less and less important and our own internal validation and our own internal voice is what really you know speaks to me but oh my god you know the things that I have had to overcome <laughs> like the thing is people go oh my god your life's amazing now and I'm like mm -hmm. it's freaking amazing like I used to have one you know amazing aha moment maybe once every six months or once a year pre-collective hub. Now I have at least one every single hour of every single day. But the converse of that is I also have a hundred really shitty, tough things come at me every single day. But you know that's where the self-belief kicks in and you're just like the question I ask myself every day when I get up is why? What's my purpose? Why am I doing this? Because when I tap into that and when I ground myself in that, anything is possible. Like anything truly is possible. Um, as soon as I deviate from that or lose sight of that, you know, it, it I don't know, it slips away and, and now the things that aren't important um, can cloud your vision. So just keep asking yourself, what is your why, what is your purpose? And for me, the delivery mechanism is largely irrelevant, which is why I've been able to morph, pivot, iterate, change throughout. Um, yes, yeah, so we can talk more about that as well, but just self-belief. <laughs> I love it, Melissa. And um, look, I don't want to steal the show, and I've got one quick question before I hand it back to uh, Laura. Um, you also talk about gut feeling when making decisions, and you mentioned 95% um, of decision making is gut feeling. I'm interested to know what the other 5% is. Uh, I don't know. Ask my CFO. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what you're saying essentially is the, the core. The core um, Success behind uh, decisionship is really about uh, using your gut feeling, which I can relate to as an entrepreneur. And is that something you can teach people, or is it something that just comes inherently? Okay, so I might talk to that for a minute because that's actually a really important point. Because I think um, after nearly 15 years of having my own business, my gut and my intuition is so um, finely tuned and honed almost to be 100%. Correct. In fact, I'm going to say it is 100% correct because I know if my gut and intuition says something and then I go against it every single time, every single time, I'm like, that just fell over. Oh, I should have listened to myself. Now, that is something that I think is innately within us, but also I think it's absolutely able to, 100% able to be learned because the reality is that my gut and intuition only through, you know, a great series of failures and some successes and a whole lot of experience, it's gotten sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper over the years, if that makes sense. So it almost is just this totally inbuilt, ingrained mechanism that is just like a default now. Because there's probably little that I haven't experienced at this point in business and so it makes it very very easy for me to just make a decision on a dime. Um, having said that, <laughs> the decisions I make now are, um, you know, they're big. We are doing deals all over the world across multiple industries and multiple you know, multiple different things continuously, but still I'm able to make decisions very quickly. Again, it comes back to the thing that I've always asked is, but why, but why, but why, but why? And I think this is a really important point because um, 
it's like we're doing a major office renovation at the moment. I know nothing about commercial renovations at all. But what I do know is how to ask the right questions. So like literally what will happen is the builder will top level say, oh, it'll be six weeks. And I just say, show me a timeline, show me this, show me this, show me this. And then very quickly when I have the information, I'm able to ask, reverse engineer it and go, ah, but why, but why, but why? Suddenly it's back to two weeks, you know? It's about, yeah, gut and intuition and having the right materials and, and asking the right questions, I think. Some great, great gems there, Lisa. I'm sure the viewers are taking a lot of notes, and so am I. Um, <laughs> I should um, slow down my speaking. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> this, uh, this session, people uh, can listen to it a million times. Um, anyway, Laura, I'm sure you've got a number of questions to ask um, before we sort of head towards the end of the show. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lisa. I think that following the gut instinct is the the, the biggest thing that I've learned certainly and I think when I first started um, Speaker's Little Secret I didn't have really a clue what I was kind of getting myself into um, but it's, it's, it's great to keep learning to trust your gut and I think those lessons come up continuously. Um, but what I'd like to do is, is, is come back around to the different revenue streams that you mentioned earlier and also how that has then led you into going um, more into the education sector because I, I think our viewers would really love to hear more about that as well. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so this is this is probably one of the most important things that I can say. Um, have you got me there? Yeah. Yeah. So I think people get so often really caught up on a specific, so I'm sitting on a chair and I have a table in front of me, right? So let's talk about the chair. I think people get really caught up on, I am going to develop a chair. And they get and they write like a 300 page laborious business plan about how I'm going to develop a chair. And it's all about the chair. I'm getting to a point that's going to make sense. <laughs> um, but my point around that is, if they actually thought about, well, what's my vision and my why? Oh, I want to create the most comfortable, extraordinary experience or whatever it is, right? And then it becomes less about the chair and you're able to morph and pivot, change, iterate, be where people want you at a time they want you, on a platform they want you. So what happened early on with me was when people said to me, oh, you're launching a print magazine, I was like, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> that was just the first piece that I launched. Um, my why is for Collective Hub um, and for Lisa Messenger will remain the same until the day I die. Unwavering, immovable. So for me, it's to be an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, living my life out loud, showing that anything's possible. For Collective Hub, it is about creating extraordinary content to empower people to be the best version of themselves. Now, the delivery mechanism, so what my point is here is about getting clear on your why, then the delivery mechanism is irrelevant. So I launched a print magazine and what I do is I'm kind of the brand architect. So from issue one to eight, and we just issue 36 landed today, issue one to eight, I learned everything there was to learn about a print magazine from content, production, marketing, distribution, every aspect of the business, every single aspect. <laughs> and then I put um, a team in place and I systemized it. And then I moved on to collectivehub.com, which is our online site, which, by the way, does way bigger numbers now than the print magazine. Mm -hmm. And then I learned everything there was to learn. You might be laughing at me now, seeing how I was with the technology at the beginning. <laughs> About, um, you know, that online space, put a team in place, systemized it. And then I moved on to, we started doing events. We started with four events a month. We do sometimes up to ten events a month now put a team in place, systemized it, and just kept moving, 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 wrote books. So we've just, we have so many different channels now, and it's it's just been extraordinary to, you know, touch base with our community on so many different channels and levels, and it also has meant that as a business owner and an entrepreneur, it has future-proofed me a little bit. So if the print magazine closed down, God forbid, tomorrow, it actually wouldn't impact me that much because each one of my business units stands alone wholly and solely. Now what's interesting about the education is we have this humongous community now across our social platforms alone. We have over 900,000 in our community now and we've been doing the empowerment piece really well, kind of showing people this is what you can do, these are the industries you can enter, these are all the extraordinary different things out there available and people have been getting really hyped up about that but then they've been kind of like, okay, we don't have the 
um, <clears throat> the technical ability or the know-how or the um, you know the actual pieces in place to to make it all happen and bring it to life. And so, I wanted to create. And also, I know that we we have had. I have had very serious meetings with seven different education partners over the last three and a half years because um, people were swimming around us, kind of wanting to partner with us, realizing, um, you know, how much we were backending my business into theirs, and um, and so I partnered recently with Torrens University Australia, which is part of Laureate, who have 80 universities in 28 countries, and the exciting thing about that is. When I went to university, I went to university just to get the piece of paper and I kind of mm -hmm. forgot about the journey. So it was all about my ego, like I want the piece of paper. So when I met with Torrance, you know, sitting in a room with <laughs> numerous academics, we have um, a team of uh, over 60 in our academic uh, or in the Torrance University team. Um, purely working on my grad, grad search in collective entrepreneurship, which is basically four units of a master's degree. And for an entrepreneur to sit in the room and say, I'm not going to learn like that. I don't want to write an essay. I want to gamify it. I want to simulate real life entrepreneurship. It's been, we've been working on it for 10 months to pull it together. And I think it is world class and we've created something that's, I think, unlike anything that exists on the planet to date. So I'm really proud of that. And our first intake is in September. Um, so it just feels like it's bookending, you know, a whole lot of other stuff. And um, yes, it's really exciting. So my yeah. lesson on that is not about, and not about my education or my business. It's really around just remember and get really clear on your why, your vision, and your purpose. And then start to work out what delivery mechanisms or what platforms or what modalities are going to work for your audience and don't try and do them all at once because <laughs> that is crazy um, you know but try and do maybe what I said if that works for you like you know learn it build it put a team in place and put some rigor and systems around it and then you know move on to the next and the next and the next if that's what you want to do yeah that's that's such good advice thank you Lisa and I think the um the education sector and your program that you're delivering sounds like a much needed um, product. I mean, for myself, certainly, you definitely need some help in regards to to getting these things set up and knowing where you're going. And yeah, it sounds fantastic. So we'd love to share some more information about that as well with our viewers um, after after the show. We'll um, we can point yeah, them in. Yeah, that would be amazing. Direction. Absolutely. Perfect. Fantastic. All right, well, I'll, I'll hand you back over to Fed um, to, to do a little wrap-up. We may have a couple of questions if we've got time, um, but I'll just, I'll just pass you over to Fed. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Thank you, Laura. Laura. Thanks, Laura. And thanks, Lisa, again, for your amazing um, detail to your, to your um, experiences there. I have one last question myself, actually, to ask you, and um, it relates to strategic partnerships. And you once mentioned in your book that you had a trip to Rome, and, and that's where you, you came across Martha Stewart. I ask this question for two reasons. One, because I was born in Rome, um, so I'm pretty um, fond of, of my own country, but also um, <laughs> being um, being part of a stationery company in the past, uh, I was actually a, um, an owner of a, of a designer stationery craft business. I came across the word Martha Stewart many times. Um, anyway, putting that aside, I guess I wanted to understand your, your intake on, on why is why are strategic partnerships so important and how do you sort of create a strategic partnership um, in, in, in relative short time? Okay. <laughs> how do I, so, God, you know what? I've been doing this forever. Like, um, <coughs> even before I launched my first business in 2001, I worked in sponsorship for a while. And it was funny because I used to... Um, and I talk about this in the book and various other things. And I used to do sponsorship for Sector Soleil and the Wiggles and all sorts of people in the arts and entertainment industry. And the company I worked for were all about um, cash. And I was always saying to them, no, no, but surely there's other ways to do partnerships. And and they used to kind of laugh at me. And, and since then, we've chatted. And they're like, ah, OK, you're kind of onto something. <laughs> um, so for me, it's a little bit about what I talked about before. So we. Um, and also what I'll say is this, business is a dance. When I launched, um, you know, what we had to give away was kind of like this, big, 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 in exchange for this, little, little, little. And now, and we had to go after people a lot, um, you know, and bang on a lot more doors. And now that the brand, the Collective Hub brand is, you know, getting a lot bigger, the dance kind of changes and we have to give away this, you know, in exchange for this sometimes. So that's kind of nice. Um, 
what we look at or what my partners look at is fit. So, you know, is there an alignment in terms of, um, you know, our vision, our belief system, our audience? And then we often look at, you know, are we, do we share similar customer profiles and, you know, are we non-competing and all that kind of thing? And then we look at how can we do business together? And really that's as simple as it is to start with. And then we look at, um, you know, is, is, that, that we're giving away, you know, X assets, and in this case now it's much more complex than the initial GLA described. So I'll talk to a corporate partner around, you know, is it that they um, do an event with us, that they, you know, um, capitalize on our online assets, do they, you know, buy my books in bulk, do I do speaking gigs, do I become an ambassador, like bang, 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 there's so many different assets that we can trade now and then you know what's that worth or is it worth half a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or whatever it is and whatever it means to anyone or actually is there a smarter way to do business and what I mean by that is do we trade our our assets and go well they have a database of like you know five million people that's kind of a cool one you know I'm not that arrogant to think everyone knows about Collective Hub at this point so do we trade based on okay well what's in it for us what's in it for you can you um, get us out and amplify us across your channels to your big audience so I'm always weighing up which makes business just so much fun it is so much fun I mean that's all I do all day every day is I trade you know and I trade in cash or I trade in other currencies and we just look at where are the fits okay cool let's that, I mean that's the most important thing to me is there a fit let's do business together and then let's work out how to do business and I mean you know people talk about collaborations now and that's largely what it is that's the buzzword of the moment but um it's just fun you know once you remove remove cash as the only way to to do business then you know anything is possible so that's all we do I've trained my entire team to think like that the two biggest words in our office um, or two of the biggest words are value exchange so we're constantly looking at where's the value what's the exchange that's great advice uh, Lisa I'm sure that um, the those aspiring entrepreneurs again are taking lots of notes uh, I'm just <laughs> And um, we have room for one question from um, one of our uh, people attending or uh, an audience uh, member. Um, Great. She, a question from Lynn. Um, she's asking a question. In one of your books, you mentioned attending meetings in your co in your Converse speakers. How important do you have? Do you think having a personal brand is as an entrepreneur, whether it be heels or Converse sneakers? <laughs> okay. So. Um... Everyone who's listening, you should follow me on Snapchat, Lisa Messenger, because I am prolific. It's like I have my own full-time TV show at the moment. <laughs> then you can see how I go to meetings. I've been my um, active work of my commies most days. Well, you know what? Actually, I'm going to say this. It's important, again, it, it's exactly what I said at the beginning about speaking or about really any aspect of my business or life. Just find out what works for you and how you can best show up as your most authentic self. So for me, I'm all about, I mean, when I really go to the essence of who Lisa Messenger is, I'm just fun and a bit nuts and a bit crazy and I don't take myself too seriously. I mean, really, that's who I am. And so what I realized was I'm not going to, I turn up in what I'm comfortable in, you know. And the thing is as well, I mean, I, I had a lot of people know this. I had a, a, an email from last year which said in the, subject matter from the office of Anna Wintour which was amazing she's kind of like the doyen you know Martha Stewart but Anna Wintour also of publishing globally and she asked to meet me in New York this was last June June 2015 and um, and I told a whole lot of people I was going to do it and everyone was like oh my god what are you gonna wear and I was like well it's kind of irrelevant you know how I show up she called a meeting with me I don't care what I'm going to wear. What I care is what's going to come out of my brain. Now, I'm being a little bit facetious because I am an editor of a magazine, so I did have a stylist start with, but it was kind of, <laughs> secondary. <laughs> it was kind of secondary to the meeting. Um, but, you know, show up in what truly represents you and what is also, I guess, applicable for the moment. So to give you a little another example there, I started... Collective Hub 
to be an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs. It is as simple as that. I didn't think too much more about it. What I didn't realize a little bit stupidly is that I'm now kind of an accidental editor. I didn't. I forgot kind of that when you have a magazine, you get invited to sit front row at fashion, all the fashion week shows, and you know get invited to the opening of an envelope every single freaking launch around the planet. I seem to be invited to now, which is beautiful and amazing. And I do you know, get dressed up appropriately in fashionable attire for these events. But I am always the one sitting in the front row because I love my doof doof, right? And uh, I'm always like there doing the, got the beats going on and everyone else is like sitting there quite properly. So I kind of just do it the Lisa Messenger way. Just find what works for you. Connie's high heels, black, denim, mm -hmm. ripped, whatever. It's <laughs> okay. Down. My philosophy is um, being on, on a Google Hangout, you can pretty much wear whatever you like because no one's going to see what you're wearing down below, so I might be wearing Oh, careful. I should show you. I have my ass on. <laughs> Love it. Stay warm. This is show list us, so we'll probably stop there. Um, now, I'll, I'll probably end up to um, we'll do a bit of a wrap up mention uh, our next show, which is in August. Uh, so, Laura, if you have that information in front of you, it would be great for the listeners to know our next show coming up. Now, if you don't, I'll yeah, sure, sure. yeah, sure. So, thank you so much, Lisa. I've taken so many notes and little My golden pleasure. little golden nuggets that you share, as you always do. Um, I think the biggest thing that's come out of what you said is 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 be yourself and trust in in what you have to offer and and go out there and and do it your way and keep going. Don't give up. You know, as an entrepreneur, you've got to keep keep finding the way, and um, I, I love what you do. I think it's it's wonderful. So uh, so keep doing it, and we'll be really excited to follow your success as it as it keeps on growing. Thank you. Absolutely, and I will hand back over to you, Fred, for the guest speaker for August, so you can share that with our audience. And thank you once again, Lisa. So grateful to have you on our show, and um, and we'll stay in touch. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. <laughs> so uh, just hang in there, Lisa, just for a moment. Uh, okay. So our, our next uh, is um, Joe Cross on the 2nd of August. Uh, so we've got another top speaker coming up very soon. Um, but on a personal note, I'd like to equally thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for for your energy, I guess. Um, what I've certainly taken note um, from your personality is the stamina that you have uh, and, and that um, belief in yourself and that perseverance and something that, that I'll definitely... Um, try to exploit myself more uh, as an entrepreneur. So once again, thanks for your time. And uh, what we'll do now is we'll just uh, go off air as we speak. So thank you.